This video is sponsored by Strata Scratch. More on them later. Let's talk about how transformer neural networks are so powerful. I'm going to explain this in multiple passes. We'll start with an overview of the architecture and then point out some components that make it powerful and just take it from there. Transformer neural networks. They were introduced to solve sequence to sequence problems. Sequences are an ordered set of tokens. Sentences are an example of sequences of words. And so transformers can solve problems like translating English to French. The transformer architecture has two main parts, an encoder and a decoder. For English to French translation, we pass in the entire English sentence into the encoder simultaneously, and then we get the corresponding word vectors simultaneously. These word vectors encode the meaning of the word. We then pass these vectors to the decoder along with the previously generated French word to generate the next French word. We keep passing in the French words until we hit the end of sentence. And so transformers can work well with sequence to sequence problems like this. But what we're seeing these days is that transformers are being used in a host of applications. So what makes them so useful? Well, looking at the architecture, it's mostly the positional encodings as well as the multi-headed self-attention. But to understand why they make transformers so versatile, we need to talk about their core, vectors. Now, before starting our discussion on vectors, I wanna talk about this video's sponsor, Stratascratch. Stratascratch is a data science interview prep website that provides thousands of interview questions from the hottest companies. The best way to learn anything is to break down the solution as much as possible. Just like how we're going to understand transformers in this video through understanding vectors, Strata Scratch does a great job in breaking down a good amount of these interview questions with videos, blogs, and solutions from the community. Also, new interview questions are released every month that cover SQL, Python coding, statistics, modeling, product sense, system design, and so much more. Basically, your entire data science starter kit. If this sounds interesting to you, sign up for Strata Scratch using my code, Code Emporium. I'm sure this is gonna help you out in your data science journey, and good luck for those interviews. Links down in the description below. So let's talk about vectors. So what are vectors? Each vector is an ordered set of numbers that represent an object that we understand. Each number is a vector that represents different characteristics of that object. If this vector represents a house, the first number could represent square footage, the second number could represent number of bedrooms, and so on. And the length of this vector depends on how many numbers you need to adequately represent that object. If I think two properties is enough to represent a house, then we have a two-dimensional vector for every house. Now, why do we need vectors? Computers don't understand real-world objects, but they understand numbers. So if we convert objects like a house into numbers, then a computer will be able to understand it and it paves way for using computers in a lot of real world applications. So example, here's a house and here are some other houses. Which of these houses is similar to the main one? It might be easy for you to tell, but a computer cannot process this information as is. So we represent each house as a two dimensional vector. The first number being the square footage and the second number is the number of bedrooms and a computer can now determine which house is most similar by running simple distance calculations. Now, how do we get these vectors? For natural language processing, a vector could also represent a word. Algorithms like word to vec or glove take in English words and map them to vectors with hundreds of dimensions. 
Each number on its own may not make sense to us humans, but each number is important for a computer to represent the meaning of the word as a whole. Now that we have the introduction to the what's, the why's, and the how's of vectors, let's look at their role in our transformer neural network architecture. In the beginning of the video, I said that we pass the English words to a transformer simultaneously. But in reality, we really can't do this since the transformer doesn't understand English words. So we first convert each word into a word vector with the help of like a word to vector glove algorithm. And then we pass these vectors into the transformer so it understands what you're feeding it. Now, the encoder processes these word vectors to in turn generate word vectors of its own. So, quick question here. What's the difference between the word vectors from the word to vec algorithm here and the word vectors that are coming out of the transformer encoder here? Well, these vectors have context awareness and these vectors do not. When drawing a word vector from the word to vec algorithm, the same word will always yield the same vector. This is not useful when dealing with sentences. Consider two sentences. The bank of the river, get money from the bank. The word bank has different meanings in both cases. But the same word vector is generated in the word to vec case. Since these vectors are supposed to indicate the meaning of the word to the computer, having both of these vectors as the same means it's an issue. What makes transformer encoder architecture so powerful is that it can add context awareness to these word vectors, making them better representing meaning. And it does this with two major components, the positional encodings, as well as multi-head self-attention. So let's talk about each of these. Positional encodings. So in recurrent neural networks, if we wanted to deal with sentences or any sequences in general, we'd pass them into the network one word at a time until the sentence is complete. And this is how networks understand which words come after the other. In transformers, inputs are passed in simultaneously. So how does the transformer understand the ordering of these words? It's through positional encodings. They are vectors created for every word to define their position. To create these encodings, we demonstrate the position of a word in a sentence and then create position vectors for every word from this with some sine and cosine formulations. The vectors are then added to every word that is now input to the network. But why are we adding them? Wouldn't this just ruin the word vectors originally? If you ask yourself this question, great, because I also had this same question when delving into this topic. And I'll try to add my reasoning here of why addition works, and you can all dispute it in the comments down below. Happy to hear some input. So let's assume that every word is represented by a one-dimensional vector. Words that are more similar to each other are those words that have closer numbers. This tells the computer that king is closer in meaning to a queen than it is to a horse. Let's define positional encoders with a simple function. That is, it's the position of the word in a sentence divided by the length of the sentence itself, or the number of words in the sentence itself. Consider the phrase king on horse. We know the word embeddings, and we can now generate positional encodings based on this simple function. Adding these up, we get the final word vectors. We see that the word vectors that are generated that account for position are not completely altered from their original meanings. So the core meaning of the king in king on horse isn't that much different from the meaning of king in a phrase like horse on king. And this makes a lot of sense. But let's change the function to create our position vector. So instead of the position divided by the sentence length, let's multiply this by 100. We have our original word vectors. We now create the new position vectors based on the new formulation. And then we add these up to get the new vectors. So the word queen is now more similar to horse 
in the phrase horse on king. <laughs> Clearly, the word vectors have lost their meaning. So main observation here is that in the first case, we retain the meaning when adding position vectors, but in the second case, we lost the meaning when adding position vectors. And this probably happens because the word vectors and the position vectors were from different distributions. In simpler terms, these numbers from the position vectors are picked very differently from these numbers in the word vectors. So adding them still preserves the meaning. Let's now look at the second component of transformers. That is the multi-headed self-attention unit. There are several parts to this that we'll break down with an example. Consider the phrase king on a horse. The attention unit decides how much attention each word needs to be paid to the other words in the same sentence. A vector is generated that encapsulates the meaning of the word in this context. We're paying attention to every word in the same sentence. This is self-attention. We generate eight slightly different variations for the attention vector that encapsulates the meaning of the word, and then we concatenate them. Eight heads, multiple heads. Hence, we have multi-headed self-attention. Now, notice that instead of adding vectors here, we are concatenating them. So why is this? Well, it's mostly that on experimentation, concatenation performed better. At this point, let's try to compare addition and concatenation and see which is appropriate and when they are appropriate. So we have two vectors. Do we add them or do we concatenate them? No hard rules, really. Concatenation increases the dimensions. Addition makes the dimensions remain the same. This is a trade-off. On one hand, this means that concatenation offers more degrees of freedom for the vector to better represent the meaning of the word. But on the other hand, it means the model needs to work with processing and storing parameters. From what I have read, we can add two vectors if they represent the same object and are drawn from the same distribution, or they represent different objects and are drawn from different distributions. In positional embeddings, we added. Positional vectors and word vectors represented different objects and were from different distributions, so it made sense to add vectors. But the case is different for self-attention. We generated eight word vectors that represent the same object and were from the same distribution. So according to the rules, I could add them However, we choose to concatenate them. I'm assuming that on trying addition and concatenation, addition did produce reasonable results. However, concatenation produced far better results that even outweighed the disadvantages of increased parameters that concatenation brought with it. Now, these are all just anecdotal thoughts I have since there's no real hard and fast rule of when to prefer addition and when to prefer concatenation. But I'll link some other discussions and references that get far more into technical detail in the description below if you're interested. So check it out. Going back to our transformer encoder, let's piece everything together that we have so far. We take an English sentence, we pass each of these through the word to vec algorithm to get the initial vectors for the words. They're not great at encapsulating context of the current sentence. We generate the position vectors for each word and add these vectors to each word. Remember, this is required since the transformer needs to know the ordering of these words since they are passed in simultaneously. These vectors are now passed through a multi-head self-attention unit, so each word will have eight associated vectors that are logically concatenated. We then have the final vector for every word. This vector better encapsulates context of the word in the sentence. And so we established how the encoder creates these meaningful vectors. If we stack these encoder units and train it on generalized NLP tasks, we get BERT. If we train BERT based architectures on sentence level tasks, we get sentence transformers. 
and sentence transformers can be used in a host of applications, like recommender systems and search algorithms, among others. And all of this fundamentally lies on vector operations. I hope this was a meaningful explanation to get another perspective on transformers. If you like this video, please drop a like and subscribe on your way out for more amazing content. And I will see you soon. Bye-bye.